Hi. In this video, I'll be demoing a sculpture of Goro from Mortal Kombat. And I'm going to show you how I improve my skills while also skipping out on practice in the traditional sense and just having fun. My name's Joe Marzelliano, a sculptor, a 3D modeler, and a 3D printer. We've all been there before. You're on your art journey, or even just starting out with an idea in mind of what you really want to make, but because you aren't at a skill level you like yet, then you decide that you have to give up on that subject matter for months or even years because you haven't yet earned the right to make what you like, at least in your own head. Maybe you like anime characters or comic books or Star Wars, but somebody saw the art you're working on and told you that the Darth Vader you drew looks more like a toaster oven than a Sith Lord. <laughs> The embarrassment takes over, and now you're spending a year working on Bridgman's gesture and Loomis's anatomy with no breaks, no fun, no subject matter you like. Just hours and hours of drawn and sculpted nudes, and not even the kinds that get likes on Instagram, <laughs> let alone having any time for uh, fun making art. Have you ever noticed how kids draw? Um, maybe when you were a kid and you ever drew with crayons and markers that you get a feeling while drawing. Um, and that's just the kind of feeling to hold on to. Uh, children get this boundless creativity that isn't marred by technical skills. They'll have a virtual painting of Peter Pan flying and sword fighting, Captain Hook with a small thumbnail of the Lost Boys looking up in awe. It's part painting and it's part comic book, but entirely in crayon. There's no perspective, there's no shading, no anatomy to speak of, and usually not even the right colors, uh, but it expresses what they wish to convey. That's the place where abstraction and realism meet to make something that's really fun. Have you ever seen what shapes kids come up with to represent animals and characters when they're sculpting them with Play-Doh? I said sculpting, by the way, deliberately, um, because their shapes are simple and their designs are symbolic, but that doesn't make them any less artistic. It, it's not playing, it's, it's sculpting. As adults, we often dismiss it as just playing, you know? Um, but it's the very nature of sculpture. A child can tell you a 10 minute story about the snail they sculpted out of a swirl and a blur of purple and blue. Who its friends are, what it does all day, what it likes to eat. <laughs> a lot of times it's character conception that's more communicative because of symbology and not realism that gets their work to the point so much better and so much more honestly than a lot of like concept sculptures out there out there today and that includes my own work but um you know th this goes away in each of us because as we get older we set this really uh nasty trap for ourselves that trap is is simple but ubiquitous it's that we can have fun at art and get objectively better on a technical level. At least we believe this. It's the lie we tell ourselves that subjective art we're making has to look like the objective version of what we're making and not the conception in our mind. Um, and this switch doesn't really come from us. It comes from outside of us. It comes from other people. You'll see here that, that at this point in the video, I'm, I'm, I'm working in the, the simple shapes and the forms that make up Goro's anatomy. Um, I'm trying to get the majority of the bulk on the sculpture there. And I'm, you know, just working in all of those simple shapes and forms as best I can based on little reference that I did use um, because the concept of Goro at that point was mostly something that I'd grown up with. Uh, playing Mortal Kombat 1 as a kid on Sega and then um, you know that famous um, Goro painting from the arcade game um, which they used to have in the local Burger King near me when I was a kid um, 
anyway, I, I know that as artists, we put ourselves through this. I've been there myself. My first four sculptures when I started out, um, one was a random bust. I did a full figure of Batman. Uh, and then I made two sculptures for my brother. I made a Walter White. <laughs> he was really into Breaking Bad at the time. And Superman. I had loads of fun making each one. And I was so excited to see myself slowly start to improve on each successive piece. Um, with the Walter White, I remember that I had even, you know, included a, a baggie of um, sky blue. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I had done the whole scene from him in the pilot episode, you know, um, in the dress shirt with uh, no pants outside of the trailer and his dress shoes, you know, holding a gun. That, that famous scene um, with Brian Cranston. Um, but then I, you know, I showed my work to a peripheral acquaintance <laughs> who, you know, it, it, that the art wasn't meant for that person. They saw my Walter White piece, didn't quite look at all like Brian Cranston. Um, and they told me it, um, they said it to my face. They just were like, that doesn't look like Walter White, dude. <laughs> and, you know, I, I didn't understand, you know, he had... He had all the things that I had put in, you know. I, oh, in my mind, the things that were working were the symbology of it. You know, he was in the desert. You know, I had painted the the ground of the sculpture desertish. You know, he had a gun. Uh, he had the baggie of the the sky blue or the blue sky, whatever it's called, in his other hand. But uh, it didn't matter. The person told me this, and um, they told me that the likeness was off. The legs were too short. It didn't look like Walter White, and it looked like a troll doll. <laughs> and you know what? It kind of did. But I responded really predictably, and the way a lot of us as artists do, which is really self-consciously. Um, and I launched myself into a summer-long, you know, June, July, and August, a summer-long human anatomy nude study of the Greek god Apollo, you know, with with photo references of a model and everything. And, uh, and um, it was good practice, but it didn't feel like that sort of boundless expression that I mentioned earlier, you know, when a child draws Peter Pan soaring over Neverland. It, it felt like painstaking work. It felt like nose to the grindstone, grinding it out. Um, all of a sudden, you know, it, 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 it changed, it instantaneously changed my relationship with a hobby that I was really growing to love very quickly. And overall, I don't regret making either the troll doll looking Walter White or that study I made of Apollo, um, but plowing a way to show, you know, the haters <laughs> isn't the best way to learn a visual art like sculpting or drawing. It sure is easier, it takes, takes less time and feels better working on subject matter you really enjoy for your own satisfaction. Or, you know, the, the close group of people, family and friends around you that who's your, you know, you know, that your work brightens up their day. Imagine how much more fun it would be to do an anatomy study knowing that you're shooting for a likeness of some subject, real or fictional, that holds value with you rather than plugging away um, where your only goal is technical ability on an objective level that is acceptable to people who you already don't like. <laughs> it's It sounds crazy when you start to put it into words, you know? Now, I, I know what you're gonna say because I'm thinking of myself too. Uh, but Joe, what about live drawing and sculpting from a model and classroom instruction? Well, yeah, there's no faster way to learn than observing from life. I agree that's true. Drawing and sculpting from life or nature is the absolute fastest way to level up, especially with a good instructor or a great instructor. I've been really lucky the, the, the several times I've been able to take a class um, when they're teaching you the fundamentals. But that's also far less arbitrary than convincing yourself that you need to lock yourself in your room and learn something um, and, and committing hundreds of hours to you know, hand or skull studies or you know, environment 
study pieces. It, it, it's it's more fun to learn from observation than than rote repetition too. You know, imagine the fact that you can observe profound details of the human body or architecture or whatever, and and have an instantaneous growth in your abilities. Like as you're observing it in nature, you're sitting in the park, you're studying a landscape, the vanishing points you're looking at they click in that moment and then they're in you. And that, that's happened to me, other artists. We, some of us have experienced this. Uh, I think it's fairly common. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, so much, it's so much better to do that. You know, the, these observations also will, will be nearly correct. You know, um, when you're learning them that way, you're not getting the rule that you'll learn in a textbook when you get them through straight observation, you know, or you know, sketching or sculpting a live model. Um, but what you're seeing is, is pretty much going to be right. You know, oddly enough, you can also repetitively practice um, the study of the head. You know, do a hundred head sketches and overlook the occipital bun or, 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 or the cranium, um, the volume of them each time and you'll be locking in a mistake that will take even longer to unlearn in the long run. You know, the, when, when, when you're learning, you know, with secondary reference or no reference at all, and you're just practicing what you think might be real, you know, whatever the mistake is that you're making without proper critique or, or, or someone looking at it or, or something like that, like, you know, you're, you're going to end up practicing, practicing that mistake then over and over again. It's going to get locked in quicker. So, yeah, I, I highly recommend life studies and, and workshop instruction, especially if you have the money and opportunity to do so. But why does that still mean that you can't sculpt Walter White or, or Peter Pan whenever you want to? Um, I, I, for one, am way more driven to learn when I've committed myself to the execution of a sculpture or a painting. Uh, you know, I, I sat down once and, and wanted to do a, a sculpture of a, of a Saturn V, not a sculpture, a painting of the Saturn V rocket. So, you know, it was a one-point perspective painting. It was, I had to learn perspective, one-point perspective. You know, it was fairly simple, but I had to sit down and do it because I was working on something that I really wanted to see and I wanted to make myself. But in the past, you know, I thought to myself, oh man, I'm, I'm pretty bad at making hands right now that don't look like catcher's mitts with hot dog fingers baking in the sun. How am I gonna sculpt Goro, for example? Like, you know, in this video. He, he has four arms, so after all, he's gonna have four hands. For one, I, I didn't abandon my interests and set to work on the metaphorical wheel of pain from Conan the Barbarian to slog out a hundred sets of hands until I was comfortable and then gave myself permission to try to execute a Goro. Instead, I recognized that skill wasn't where I wanted it to be at that time, so I needed to give that part of the piece extra attention. I deliberately picked a project, this Goro, that forced me to sculpt four hands and work past my discomfort faster. See, in, in doing that, you can control for the fact that you're working on a subject matter you love and are passionate about, but also take some extra time to nail an aspect that's giving you trouble. And it's worked for me. Um, during this sculpture, you'll, you'll see me doing stuff with heads too. Not only do I end up sculpting Goro's head more than, than what you're seeing now at this point in the piece, which is just a roughed in rough volume, you know, sort of meta, you know, a, a sort of like a low poly version, if you will, low resolution. Um, but I did later on, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. I did three skulls at his feet and a severed head in his right hand that he's holding up like a trophy, like he just did a fatality in Mortal Kombat. It might be good or somewhat not so good design, but it's fun to look at. And also it lets me complete one sculpture with five heads and four hands, you know? And it was a lot of fun and my friends got a kick out of it. And my family thought it was cool and I 3D printed it and painted it and I had a lot of fun with it. Let me get this straight. You will get better faster, more immediately, at drawing or sculpting hands, for example, if you do sit down and make a hundred of them in one or two sittings. It's just that for me and for a lot of artists, 
this is really monotonous, soul crushing. Like this exercise, it, 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 it almost, <laughs> it, it, it makes so many people feel hopeless when they're 40, when they're 40 units into a 100 unit exercise. There's a reason that sort of practice is relegated to homework and a letter grade in, in so many schools. Instead, I made my hundred hands, so to speak, over the course of 20 sculptures, keeping the best of those hundred hands in my 20 finished works. I actually still do this with heads. I started doing this little bit of exercise work in projects when I heard that it's how old masters would execute perfect portraiture or foreground elements into some of the best masterpieces of all time. You can finish the background and leave the face of the portrait for later and practice it 20 times on a separate piece of paper, separate pieces of paper before deciding to plop it down onto the canvas the one time perfectly. Look, man, for one, I'm not a better painter um, than Sargent, or I'm not a better sculptor than Raphael, who did the same sort of thing on a lot of his small bronzes. You know, the great artist didn't have all the time in the world to spend on an eternity of academic studies, even though they did them. And I don't, I don't have an unlimited amount of time either. It's important to recognize and say that I have a lot that I'd like to accomplish with my art in terms of projects, and you do too, probably. And again, our time is limited. I have so many concepts and ideas that inspire me that sometimes it feels like I'm gonna burst. It makes me regret that I don't have four arms like Goro and also six eyes to make it all as fast as I'd like. You might wonder why six eyes, and the answer is binocular vision, with better visual acuity and full color perception like an arachnid, but that's neither here nor there, nor there. What I'm saying is that at any given time, I'm usually working on three or so multiple character sculpts. For example, right now I could tell you that I'm making a 16 character Star Wars diorama based on the Mandalorian from Disney Plus. An alien meeting cavemen, as a resin model kit with three characters and a Japanese Oni demon model kit. All at the same time as I'm doing a 12 or more character Christmas Village miniature character project. I might need more than those forearms and certainly a second resin 3D printer. But still the point is that if I don't feel comfortable with the likenesses I've done recently of Bill Burr as Mayfeld and Rosario Dawson as Ahsoka, I have other opportunities to practice their likenesses and other characters too. It's just not worth it for me to get hung up on anything like that because I'm currently working on these other 20 or so pieces right now. I'm guaranteeing myself diligent work on all this stuff because I care about getting them all done. So I'm also not suffering from boredom or art block. I don't owe this to anybody but myself. My whole workflow is project-based, and I can say without any hesitation that it's not slowing me down. It's part of why I'm so fast. Speed and ability are related, although the connection isn't always noticeable. Are you willing to accept that maybe you can't always force leveling up your skill set? Maybe that's a conversation for another time. Getting objectively better at the skills in any given visual media it's not something that you can control getting better at any time or else everyone would just be a perfect master. Every, every painting would be like a photograph. Every sculpture would be like a 3D scan with 20, mega, 20, 20 million megapixels. And it, it would be, it would, you know, everyone would be able to do all of this stuff immediately. But let's just talk for a second about that process of getting in the zone and entering the flow state. Now, this process and this topic has been covered to death by people much more elegantly than me and in much greater depth than I'm willing to go into in this video. But for now, let's just assume that 
you finished a piece. You finally just finished a sculpture portrait of, let's say, Abraham Lincoln. That meant a lot to you personally. It has a lot of emotional value for you. And time just flew by while you made it. Most of us can relate to this experience of making a personally important piece. And even though you tried one or two new techniques you heard about, you mostly zoned out and barely remember anything about the process except how great it made you feel while making it. Now that it's finished, you can't help but think to yourself, huh, this is, technically speaking, the best piece I ever did. And you can't even really remember what you did while making it better. It happens very frequently to me and any of my artist friends um, and a lot of others that we aren't directly controlling our ability um, and growth and skill development and, and even the execution sometimes. It just feels like this automatic thing, like a, like a waking daydream. I, I mean, it, it's a very odd experience, but it's, it's part of the reason which makes people find the process of creating art so enjoyable. Also, the largest jumps in ability level happen without us paying attention to it under such a critical microscope. To me, that alone makes it worth it to enjoy the process of making art again. That and, you know, the having fun part. There's just no reason to do anything that doesn't interest you if your experience will suffer for it. Um, I mean, why else are we doing this? But sometimes we do work on things that don't interest us. And usually when other people's opinions mean more to us than our own taste is when we find ourselves in those situations. It's a weird double-edged sword, man. Sometimes we get so hung up on the fact um, that the person who our art really wasn't meant for saw our work and had a negative comment or an opinion and we decide to pay for that embarrassment ourselves with practice more akin to self-flagellation than improvement. You know, somebody walks up to you and tells you the texture of the skin on your sculptures looks, you know, it's really weird, man. Skin doesn't look like that. It's, it's, it's holy. It's got a lot of holes. And then you're like, what the hell? And then, you know, you, you, you do a lot of fishing on the internet and then a lot of practicing and, you know, a, a lot of texture studies. And all of a sudden now you're, you're, you're spraying down all your clay with either mineral spirits or rubbing alcohol or mixing it with orange glow to see how that could work and i mean again like these, these are all things that eventually these skills grow and you learn them and you pick them up over time but to have them come to you because of an insecurity that somebody else put on you and you were willing to accept rather than enjoying what you were doing and then losing time on the things you want to make because of it it's just it's just such a waste it really is I mean, what's just as bad, but in the opposite direction, is when somebody absolutely loves like that one mech robot you sculpted that one time. And now for continued attention or likes on social media or whatever, the girl that you like, you find yourself cranking out mech after mech when really you prefer doing something else entirely. Um, you, you only did a mech because you wanted to try out something that you heard about doing like kit bashing and, and now now you're the mech guy now you are the, you're the new architect of gundam wing 2021 you know it's it's it, it can be a really it can be a really bad headspace it, it's kind of weird to examine a problem that comes along with success when so many of us as artists are, are hell-bent on fame and notoriety and uh, you know, getting getting good. Um, but it is a special kind of torture to put upon yourself to either have to be a slave to some form of success or too afraid to let go of an endless pursuit of skills you'll never express in a finished cohesive project. At least not one that you're proud of. Um, this goes for someone completely unknown, Internet famous, professional gallery artists, everyone in between. I've, I've, I've had this conversation with, you know, my friends, my teachers, 
random artists I've met, photographers. Like this is this is like not an uncommon thing. Um, I've known at least one photographer that does fashion shoots with you know um, you know does fashion shoots with models, but they prefer landscapes. But there's no money in being Ansel Adams, so they're stuck in this hell of their own making, you know, photographing pretty girls that they don't want to anymore. It's, it's weird. It's a weird thing. Um, I, haven't, I haven't met one artist at any point in their art journey who hasn't expressed basically either side of this dilemma, especially when it comes to social media. Um, usually it's not so much about money as it is likes and that's that's another that's another thing that that probably warrants a longer video or a more in-depth one just about that but we'll we'll talk about that i guess another time really all we need to do to escape either of these vicious cycles is just let go make what you want once in a while you might suffer for the likes you might not get paid to do it People might not care or the people that see it might have some, you know, nasty stuff to say, but like you could let it roll off your back. It's just a picture you made. It's just a sculpture you did once. And, you know, if you're using Chavant clay like I do, you just recycle the piece and make something else. It's not like you're even wasting the materials. And that's that's important, too. Um, you know, if you're drawing, you know, pencil on paper. You know, geez, what's the cost of a of a of a sketch? It's <clears throat> less than a penny. If you're making a painting, I get it. There's there's material costs involved. When it comes to a sculpture, if you're using polymer clay, it can slow you down from taking on projects. If you're if you're considering the fact that once you bake it and it's hardened, you've used up that material and goodness a pound of super sculpey goes for i think 17 or 19 dollars now so i i get why the hesitation there and you'd want to pick your project super carefully but if you're using oil-based clay like i do you know this goro eventually was recycled and turned into the mandalorian and turned into the flash and turned into a mermaid and you know i recycle my my clay um, you know, for as long as possible, unless I lose bits of it or something. But I, you know, it's gotten to a point where now I have too much clay because it's recyclable than I'll likely ever use unless I get a bigger studio. And that's not bad. That's not bad. But anyway, it, it seems like a pretty good deal to me. I get to make whatever I want, and so do you. <laughs> and we can improve the quality of our art somewhat or over the course of many projects done rather quickly. I'm not beholden to anyone's criticism of my work, and neither should you be, because it's fun, makes us happy. Some of it will resonate with the people in our lives and online, and some of it won't. It won't all fit nicely into a theme or necessarily a style or your portfolio, but maybe that is your style. Maybe that is your portfolio. Maybe it's a piece that makes you happy, God forbid. At the very least, I'll be free from having to make sets of hands until some faceless, nameless commission on, quote, good artists from my imagination summonses me to a hearing at the court of art and issues a verdict to award me a conditional permit to make sculptures until such a time, um, you know, like that that permit is revoked because, you know, like the hands don't look right. And then at that point, they'll remove their powdered wigs and they'll furrow their brows to sentence me to 20 years of hard labor in the anatomy construction mines. Or I'll swing a pickaxe all day in search of sculpted hands that look less like an angry fiddler crab. You get the point. Focus on whatever subject matter you'd like to see brought into the world because nobody else is going to, man. The only negative critic of your art that's emotionally invested in your work is you. And you alone will also be a fan that won't abandon you when you stop drawing or sculpting whatever their weird obsession is. It makes a lot of 
sense and it's easier to relax by focusing on the work of your own weird obsessions. You know, look, man, if, if, if this kind of stuff has been helpful, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, and I look forward to talking more about this kind of stuff. It's, it's why I'm on YouTube. You know, there's, especially with the pandemic going on, hopefully winding down, there's not really a lot of resources to get in touch with other artists out there that I'm not already friends with. <laughs> um, so, you know, if, if you'd like to, uh, to continue a conversation like this, definitely leave a comment. You know, um, if you want to see more of my work, I'd appreciate if you left a like or subscribe to my videos, but definitely leave a comment. It's awesome for me to share my work like this and, and talk to more artists like you about what our experience is with art and with skill development, all that kind of stuff has been, you know, here on YouTube, it's, it's such a great space for that because it's long form. Um, but yeah, thanks for stopping by and, um, you know, I'll stick around for the remainder of the video and provide some technical commentary on the piece that I'm working on here. Um, you saw in the beginning of the video was totally finished and now even though it's sped up I'm, I'm working on it this was originally streamed some time ago um, so I'll you know at this point in the video it looks like I'm working on Goro's head so it's head one of five for this piece so I'll stick around and I'll, I'll offer some some comments um, on the technical side and discuss them and um, you know until next time Thanks. You know, at this point in the video, I'm actually working on Goro's um, yin yang that sits in the center of his belt, um, and it's it's really interesting because you know getting a perfectly circular object like that um, sculpted traditionally is it's a little bit of trial and error, and it takes a little time and cutting away and being patient with yourself. Um, and just like everything else we've been talking about here on this video, a little bit of practice. Um, I'm using, um, you'll see I'm using a ballpoint stylus and I'm also using um, some classic sculpting tools from ceramics um, as a knife edge to try to get the, the right shape and detail on it and everything else like that. And um, you know, take some time, but but you'll see it, it. It really does work out rather well. It's so much easier to do it that way um, than to. Uh, it's so much easier to do it that way um, than to you know sort of lose patience with yourself. And it's even easier to do it digitally uh, in something like ZBrush or you know Sculpt GL, which is totally for free, um, where you can just sort of mask the piece with the masking tool and extrude some clay outward and then just sort of sculpt into it and it's perfectly circular or you can just flatten a sphere and, and stick it onto the mesh when you're working traditional of course um you know you just got to take your time you know you got to use some clay tubes um and you have to refine your shapes Here you'll see me employ a technique where I'm using a paintbrush and isopropyl alcohol to smooth down the texture of the skin um, on Goro here. So 
um, when you're using oil-based clay, and I'm not quite sure with polymer clay, but when you're using oil-based clay like Chavant or Monster Clay, um, you can take isopropyl alcohol and just dip a paintbrush into it or use a, a spray bottle and spray the surface down. And it will slightly, at a chemical level, melt the clay, um, which will make it much softer. So then the bristles of the paintbrush will be like a micro rake in order to give a very, very smooth texture. Um, and this technique was taught to me um, years ago uh, by Simon Lee, um, who, who's a Hollywood sculptor. He's worked on a lot of, uh, a lot of um, different movies. Like he made all the monsters for Pacific Rim. And I believe he was the concept sculptor for um, Godzilla vs. Kong, which came out earlier, earlier this year. Um, and that's, that's a really good technique. You, you get great results from it. And then, and then later on, I actually learned another technique, which you won't see in this video, but I'll, I'll demo it at some other later time and I'll upload a video where you can use 100% um, orange oil. So you can use something like Orange Glow, which is used as a, you know, wood, a wood furniture cleaner, but it's got no chemicals in it. It's just orange oil, you know, from orange peels. And you can mix that with oil-based clay, some of it, and just leave it in a separate container. And the orange clay will dilute the oil-based clay. You know, it's like it's like putting something water-based into more water. It's like watering down your paints. It waters down or oils down your your clay, and then you can dip a paintbrush into that and get a watered-down clay, a slurry. Um, and that's even more effective, and it actually replenishes your older recycled clay from breaking down. See, the reason I stopped using the alcohol technique here is because over time, the alcohol, even though it, it, it when it breaks down the clay, it's actually drying it out. It's pulling the oil out of the clay, and that's why you're getting that, that, really, that really tough, slick surface but you can get the same thing by watering it down and then the clay is actually more malleable in the future. So when you have oil-based clay, if it's getting a little kind of crusty and old, you throw some orange oil in there and, you know, close up the, you know, you can close up the, the container and it should replenish it. And I'm talking like if you have five pounds or more, you know, way less than a tablespoon should be able to do it. And if it's something like a one-to-one -one ratio, that's that's how you'll make up that slurry. You know, that slurry should really be like a, almost like a one-to-one -one ratio of orange oil to clay. And that'll that'll break down enough of it that you could use with a, with a painter's brush to really get that smooth surface. And that, that looks even more like skin. So there's, there's levels, there's levels to everything. And like I, like I've been saying this whole video, it's just it's just not worth it to limit yourself by not working on a project because there's always a better way you could be doing it. There's a, there's always another level. There's always another technical aspect. So make the stuff you want to make, man. So here's the part of the video where I am practicing what I preach. Um, despite my intentions and my best efforts, I have an anatomy textbook open and I am sculpting the second of five heads that'll be in this project and I'm constructing them as best as best I can. Um, I'm trying to put in what I know of the forms, and that's not to say that I'm not gonna make any mistakes, and I certainly made a lot. Um, in fact, with the finished product, you know, uh, personally, I think I think that a lot of these skulls ended up being a little too wide, um, you know, looking at them uh, face on, they ended up being a little too wide, a little too beefy. <laughs> but, you know, it, this project helped me to see that. You know, you make, 
you make four skulls or you make five skulls, five heads, and um, they all kind of look a little too thick when you're done with them, sometimes you can see that too. Um, but I'm, I'm always, I'm always conscious. Like I, like I said earlier, I'm always pretty, trying to be pretty aware to not lock in mistakes, but, but that's, that's part of the natural process too. That's why instruction exists and good criticisms from, from friends that are better than you and instructors and guys on the internet who you bother in your DMs. And, you know, if you're looking at this and, 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 and this is at a level that you're not at, um, you know, definitely feel free to reach out to me. I, I have no problem giving anybody any kind of crits um, on volume in the head. And, you know, it's it's worthwhile. One head seems to be down now and uh, <laughs> working on head number three. You know, Goro needs, he needs a pile of skulls to stand on or else he's just not that half dragon man we all love. By the way, the textbook that I'm using in that video, I, I still have, it's, the name of it is The Artist's Guide to the Anatomy of the Human Head, Defining Structure and Capturing Emotions. And I'm not sure who it's by. Um, you know, it doesn't have an author, but the editor is Debbie Cording. So, you know, it's a it's a straight up textbook, man. It's by it's by 3D Total Publishing, and it's it's good. A lot of the, it's definitely meant more for 3D artists because a lot of the écorches and renderings in the book are 3D models. They're like, you know, ZBrush sculpts in grayscale. And there, there's some sketches too, but it's it's definitely um, a good read. And there's there's good study in there for rendering emotion. Um, you know the the musculature anatomy is is definitely light. I would I would much I would much rather you get like a penguin anatomy of the Facebook, which is something else that I have, rather than um, use this for that. But in terms of the section here where they illustrate different emotions and what muscles have to pull in order to express them is really really good um and and one that always stuck in my mind which is in this book is disgust and um i tried to express it a little bit in this piece with the final of goro in that when you um, illustrate disgust It is the only emotion that human beings express in an asymmetrical way. So when a human being is disgusted, um, the eyebrows will not be symmetrical. Usually one will be up, you know, and one will be down. And then in addition, the mouth also will be asymmetrical. One side of the mouth is curled up and one is curled down into a frown. And that's, that's how you know when someone is grossed out or disgusted or just done with you. Um, we're done with the situation. Not necessarily you. You're fine. I'm good. Not us. But, you know, the situation. Um, you know, uh, but, and it's funny because if you have a symmetrical mouth, even in a frown, one eyebrow up, one eyebrow down, you're either the rock or um, that can be confusion. Um, but when, when the mouth is curled asymmetrically to match the eyes, the, the, the brows of the eyes curled asymmetrically, it's discussed 100% of the time. Um, and th there's, uh, I actually watched a TED talk also on this in the research for this Goro piece where um, it was a TED talk on reading people's emotions. And when they talked about disgust, they used a picture, a famous picture um, in this TED talk of a former 
Vice President Dick Cheney. And it was during a debate, I think, or something. And he looked really disgusted. And he was doing this face, like the classic version of this face, where he was he was scowling at someone or at some situation, not you, not me, <laughs> in disgust. And one eyebrow was up, one was down, um, matching that at the bottom of the face. One part of the mouth was curled. One part of the mouth was um, uh, further up, higher. And that's that's disgust, man. It's it, Anyway, great book, The Artist's Guide to the Anatomy of the Human Head. I highly recommend it. you'll notice that with the two heads that are finished here while I'm working on the third skull, um, you'll notice that there are way different forms in the top of the cranium above the brow line. You'll see that the skull there in front of the laptop on the left has a much lower brow and sloping forehead. You know, th this this one very well may have been a Cro-Magnon man, or maybe I was more in the, you know, at this point, I was more in the habit of sculpting something like Gora, where there is a sloping brow on purpose, and that had leaked into my style. And then you'll see on the right, the second skull is, is thinner. It has much more delicate um, cheekbones, um, a narrower mouth, and then a higher cranium as well. So, you know, you, you, there's also a, there is an, um, a responsibility to be observant of your own work and see the difference when, when you are doing multiples, when you are, in a sense, putting a little bit of practice into your projects, put attention into it. Don't just, don't just go on autopilot there. This is the part where you're taking yourself out of the zone um, to focus on a skill. You know, you're giving yourself so much time, you know, in a flow state, in the zone, just making something that makes you happy. Um, and then um, and then when you look at the at the third skull there, it's even more sensitive. So, you know, uh, I think it's I think it's pretty important to um, to really give yourself that just that extra bit of patience and definitely a critical eye as your work progresses, especially at those times where you say, you know what, well, you know, I am gonna make Darth Vader. He's not gonna look like a warped toaster oven, but I'm gonna make five Darth Vader masks and pick the best one. Yes, good, do that. But definitely take a look at what makes each of them different and put them all up in a line. Which one did you do first, second, third, fourth, and fifth? Um, and I'll give you a little secret. I always find that the last one tends to be the best. It's not perfect. It's certainly not from observation, but it usually is the best one. And that's also the value with doing um, multiples is that, uh, you know, you, you, you crank out that multiple and then all of a sudden, you know, you thought number four was really good and then five, six, seven don't impress you. The number eight is in a totally different style and then, the 10th one is like, whole oh, wow, you know. Um, but it, it's it's how, how willing you are for that to feel like fun as well and not a slog.
in order to construct it into you know the severed head that's in uh, that's in Goro's hands. I purposely um, again slowed myself down, took myself a little bit out of the flow state, and just um, you know just took some time to go from a skull to working in the muscles and then smoothing them out into skin to give myself the appropriate amount of defeat and dread of a recently defeated yet unnamed sort of Mortal Kombat opponent for Goro. Um, I always liked in that first Mortal Kombat movie from the from the 90s, you know, where it occasionally you see a character fight someone who's just an unnamed opponent and they just get, you know, they get frozen by Sub-Zero and shattered into a million pieces or just, you know, Goro just rips him in half or whatever he does. But, um, yeah, man. Also, I gotta say, because of the subject matter of this video, and this is not a movie review, but that new Mortal Kombat movie was pretty great. <laughs> I loved it. I was happy Goro was in there, man. I know he's been, you know, uh, dead and, and, and revived and such in the games, but, you know, spoiler warning, but, um, you know, it was, it was cool to see him in, like, a new movie where he was, like, properly CGI'd and stuff, so... Uh, for me, that was that was really awesome. I completed this piece, I, I think, uh, uh, two years ago, so that was, or, or a year and a half ago. So I, I knew that that movie was in development, but I, I totally jumped the gun, and instead of getting in on the trend, I, I I made a sculpture a year and a half out of the movie coming up. So yeah, man, do it when it inspires you. Don't do it to jump on a trend. And again, you'll you'll see me here just taking a last pass with the isopropyl alcohol and a cheap Craft Smart brush that you could get from Michaels. Uh, just smoothing out some last details on the skin and uh, the opponent's head and the hair that I put in there. Of course, you know some hair, and that that helped me do a couple of things. Helped me really show. Um, that even though I had sculpted the fingers independently of this head and without having to then to open them up and interlock them around the hair, adding a little bit more volume in the hair allowed me to really give off the illusion that Goro's fingers were holding this head and not a shared armature wire. So there's a little bit of an illusion there, but you could see in my face here, man, I'm, I'm happy. You know, this is something that I had in my imagination that I grew up with that that I loved, you know, a video game that I, I've spent many hours playing and fighting with my brother over the controllers with, and there it is. So anyway, thanks a lot, and um, we'll talk again next time.